I thought that, uh, <clears throat> that transition with the video is a good introduction to my talk because I'm actually talking about how things don't always work out well. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys arranging that just to kind of illustrate my talk this morning. Isn't that kind of true? Have you ever noticed that things don't always work out well, right? And it's uh, funny, one of the games we play in, in Christ Christian stuff is we pretend that things are going to always work out well, and we kind of get excited about things working out well, and we preach that things are going to work out well, and it's going to be good if you follow, follow Jesus, and your life will be changed, and everybody's lives around you will be changed, but actually it's not. It doesn't happen that way, and life isn't actually that way, is it? A real life isn't that way, and I think we do ourselves a disservice, we do each other a disservice when we pretend that things are going to always go well. So I was telling Daniel this morning, I, I woke up... Um, I woke up, this, I flew in from Denver, Colorado, where I live. We live uh, part-time in the Middle East and part-time in Denver. For, so I flew in from Denver last night and had a nice little talk arranged for you guys this morning. And I woke up this morning at 6, not because I'm so spiritual, but because uh, of time difference. It was 7 in Denver, so I just woke up at 6 and um, had this whole new thought. So here's the new thought. Um, I'm going to first start out by, I've never done this before, I'm going to start out and I'm going to tell you I'm doing this so it, it makes it okay. I'm going to start out by impressing you with how cool I am. Okay, is that okay? I mean, that, that can be humble actually as long as you say that you're doing that, right? Have you, do you know that? If I pretend like I'm not doing it and I do it, that's, that's, pr that's pride, but this is actually humble. I don't know if that's really true or not. That was just a kind of a cool way to say impressive things about myself. No, I, I'm doing this for a purpose because I'm going to come back around, okay? So, and some of you guys know this because, as uh, was just mentioned, I oversee the Middle East Studies program here, uh, the online, these six online courses. I teach one of them, Jesus in a Muslim context, and then the other ones about Islam in the Middle East and Israeli-Palestinian stuff and even public policy, and Muslim, Christian, Jewish relations, all that. Great classes, by the way. <clears throat> hint, hint. Plug, plug. Uh, I oversee those. So, <clears throat> so I know you a little bit, and you know me a little bit if you've been around for more than a year. So you know some of these things. But I just want to tell you real quickly some cool things that God has done and does uh, through me, and who knows why, but these are actually true. So starting with uh, this, this is an iPhone 6 Plus. Those are my notes, by the way, uh, which is kind of funny. I would never have this phone because it's way too big. It doesn't fit in any pocket or anything. It, I mean, it does absolutely nothing other than take up lots of space. But uh, anyway, I have one, and I got it as a gift just two weeks ago uh, in Sudan, in northern Sudan. I was uh, in northern Sudan. I've been asked to come and speak. Uh, you know, the U.S. puts different countries on their terrorist watch list and even their banned, you know, you can't go there list. So one of those countries in North Sudan. So of course I went there. Um, <clears throat> and after I spoke uh, to the Sudanese parliament, the, the foreign minister gave me this phone as a gift. So there you go. So I don't know if you caught that. I spoke to the Sudanese parliament and what the president of Sudan, Bashir, asked me to speak about was Jesus, the great peacemaker. So I said, hmm, let's see here. Okay. And so I did that. I went to Sudan for three days, two weeks ago. And as I was leaving, the foreign minister gave um, my wife a, a bunch of gold jewelry, which she actually doesn't know what to do with. Like, when, when do you ever wear actual gold jewelry anywhere? Or at least us. So we're trying to figure out how to, like, pawn it or something. <laughs> that's probably not nice to say that, is it? Actually, no, that's not. It was a very lovely gift that I don't think will ever be worn. And then they gave me in a box a brand new iPhone 6. I already had an iPhone. I was fine with the littler one. But anyway, now I have that. So uh, again, some of you know this. Remember, I'm trying to impress you just to make sure that you're paying attention because I have something important to say to you. Uh, you know that I'm good friends with Mumford and & Sons and actually talked to, talked to Marcus Mumford yesterday on the phone. They're in New York right now. He's, they're going to be on Saturday Night Live this Saturday night. I've known the Mumford family since... Actually, Marcus Mumford, the founder of the band, was eight when I first met him. And when he was 12... He led worship, uh, he kind of led, sort of led worship with a guitar for this youth gathering that I did in England, and it was awful. And I told him, I said, Marcus, I don't think you have a, uh, a future in worship leading. <laughs> and he points out now that that's true. He doesn't have a future in worship leading. Um, and uh, actually in July, July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, I'm going to meet with the Pope, the Vatican. I, I get to take a bunch of Middle Eastern heads of state and meet with Pope Francis for three days and the cardinal. There's nine cardinals that kind of oversee the... And what's funny is, I'm not a politician, so I don't know why I hang out with politicians. I don't even like politics. I think politics are uh, mostly a waste of time. I'm not a, I'm definitely not a rock star, as you might notice. I mean, I don't look like a rock star, and I can't play any instrument, and I can't sing, so I don't know why I know 
all the, I mean, I know Isaac Slade of the Fray and Ryan Tedder of One Republic. They, these are Denver bands, you know, and I know all these rock guys, and we, I mean, I mentor them. I talk to them about Jesus and try to encourage them in the faith, but I don't know anything. I actually don't even like their music. When Mumford & Sons first came out, I was like, that's horrible. Get rid of that banjo, which they have now. They've gotten rid of the banjo, so, that, and that wasn't my fault. I didn't do that, because <laughs> I think that's, I got used to the banjo. And I don't even know any Catholics. Seriously, I'm, I'm a, like as Protestant as you could possibly be, and now I'm meeting with the Pope. That's just weird. Um, on the weird uh, political thing, the, the Foreign Relations, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee asked me to submit a paper on Iran, my, my thoughts on what we should do with Iran, and I did. And uh, whether you like this or not, they're actually, I don't know how much of it has to do with my paper, but it was submitted as an official document to the Foreign Relations Committee, and they are actually now doing with Iran what I suggested, which I'm sure wasn't because I suggested it, because anyway, who cares what I think. But I know I, we have no money. We never came from money. The richest person I knew was my dad, and I think he made like $20,000 a year as a pastor of a small church in a small town in Nebraska and Colorado. But I know ser several billionaires uh, around the world. And then I just saw... He's not up there now, but uh, N.T. Wright. Tom Wright is a good friend of mine. I mean, if you're a theologian, like a well, professor is here, that's impressive. If you're a student, you're kind of going, now, who is that N.T. Wright guy again? An old stodgy British theologian. By the way, he's like, he's like the Marcus Mumford of theologians. I don't know if that even makes sense. He's a rock star. He is so cool. And he's become a good friend, spoken at several of my conferences that we do in Denver. We do a conference called Simply Jesus. I basically stole the title of his book, Simply Jesus, and then invited him to come speak at my conference. And then he was obligated to, so he did. And a uh, good strategy. And so I know, I know these kinds of people. Who knows why? I'm not, I'm not particularly a theologian. I'm probably a popular theologian. I love the scriptures. I love, obviously, I love God. I like to follow Jesus. I think here's the issue. Here's the point of why I told you all those cool things that are happening right now. First of all, to kind of make fun of myself, I'm not, I'm not any of those things, but also to say, I think there's like a popular thing in, especially when uh, speakers maybe speak to young people, of encouraging you to go for it. Like, to really, you can change the world. I mean, even my own kids, I have uh, kids who are 24, 23, 20. I don't know when you stop calling them kids, but they're still my kids. But even in, in that generation, your generation, there's a lot of talk about changing the world and uh, do important, doing important things, and uh, you know, going for it, and, and you, you can do it. There's a lot of focus actually on you. I'm here to tell you you actually can't change the world. There's no way, you can't change the world. Jesus can, and he sometimes uses us a little tiny, I, I've been working in and on the Middle East for 32 years, and if you've noticed, the Middle East has gotten worse. Like the longer I work there, the worse it gets, almost like in direct proportion. The more I get involved, so I'm not changing the Middle East, <clears throat> or maybe I'm changing it for worse. You cannot, and I think that puts weird pressure on you when you think that this adventurous life you're going to live is uh, going for it with God, which I'm obviously all for, is going to change the world. It's not. I have, a <clears throat> I have one copy. I have a new book. It just released yesterday, so I have one copy that I'm giving to Daniel. Uh, it's a book called Adventures, Adventures in Saying Yes, A Journey from Fear to Faith. That literally came out yesterday, so <clears throat> I'm sure I see you all downloading it right now on your iPad and uh, your Kindle. Uh, but anyway, so this book is about living an adventure with God. It's about overcoming fear, going for it. It's about doing the things that I talked about doing. So why would I say then you can't do it? Because I think it's so important that you understand that when you, when you focus on the adventure, when you focus on changing the world, when you fail, <clears throat> and you will fail, you, you won't always succeed in that. When you fail at doing that, you will become so discouraged and so disenfranchised with yourself and maybe even with God that I've seen people even leave the faith. If you focus on changing the world, I'll tell you what I think we should focus on in a second. But let me tell you first about some of the hard things that have happened to me. So you, you heard the cool things and you're like, oh wow, he's meeting the Pope. And mostly, mo I, mostly the murmur was when I said Marcus Mumford, you know, the Pope, whatever. Marcus Mumford, he knows Marcus Mumford. Yeah, but the Pope. Yeah, but Marcus Mumford, he's a rock. Anyway, so <clears throat> also what's happened is I've been put in jail five times. I've been kidnapped in Iraq twice, actually at the same spot. That was kind of dumb. I went, I went, <laughs> I went back there, you know. So you're probably kind of thinking, so that's, that doesn't sound very bright. He doesn't sound very smart. 
Yeah, you can ask my wife. Um, oh, this is, I, I wrote down, kicked out and gunned to the head. I thought it was, uh, anyway, I thought it was kicked in the head. I've been kicked out of the, I've been kicked out of a country twice. I've had a gun to my head, like literally the barrel up against my head two times. I've been shot at one other time. One time, I'll just tell you a quick story. One time, <clears throat> there was this uh, horrible beach, um, uh, a horrible storm that, that wiped out all these houses on the beach just south of Beirut. A few years back when we were still living in Lebanon, we lived in Beirut for 12 years. <clears throat> and uh, all these poor people's homes were washed away, I mean, literally washed away. And six people died, were washed out to sea, and I think four of them were children. And a bunch of other people were injured. Everybody, literally everybody lost their home, about, about 1,000 people. So we had this great, this great idea to, um, um, you know, take them blankets and food and, and serve them. <clears throat> and I think it was a good idea to go. And so we raised a little bit of money. And I thought it'd be fun for my, you know, whole family to go. <clears throat> we've tried to involve our kids in everything that we've done from the beginning. So the kids at the time, at that time, were probably uh, 14, 13, and 11. And my wife, Chris, and I, and the three kids piled into our van. A bunch of people had donated food. A couple other vans of food and blankets and stuff were coming. So there were three vans. So we pulled down first. We pulled down off the main highway, off of Beirut, down to this beach community, which was devastated. People were just kind of milling around. It just happened the night before. And, um, and our van was packed full of stuff. And as soon as we pulled up, a big crowd gathered. And Chris and the kids uh, jumped out. And I was going to pull forward a little bit further and they went back with some other friends. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, the crowd got really big, re really fast. I don't know if you've ever been in a place th that's desperately poor, but when you show up with help, sometimes in places that are desperately poor, you know, it just attracts a crowd because they think maybe you have food, which we did have. So I'm in the van. I'm trying to pull forward a little bit more because it was kind of the van was sitting like this. I wanted it to be on level ground so we could unload things. And then the crowd just kind of packed in around the van. <clears throat> and the next thing you know... I don't know where this man appeared with a pistol and he started shooting up in the air. That never feels like a good idea because I don't know if he knows, knows you know, kind of like the law of gravity, but bullets come back down. But anyway, he's shooting up in the air and they're, they're bullets, you know, there's not, not blanks. And then they're looking inside, they see boxes of food inside our van. So he takes the butt of the pistol, you know, the handle part right there, and he comes up to my window and he goes, bam! and he shatters the window on my driver's side, went right there. Well, Chris and the kids are back there. All they hear is shooting, 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 and then they hear this explosion in my window. They, they, sh they thought I've been shot. I actually thought I was shot. I actually flinched and thought, I'm shot. And then I kind of went, well, I don't feel shot, you know, but I, did, I didn't know how that felt. I haven't been shot before, but I thought that, and then I realized if, if this was heaven, that's probably not good. And Anyway, then I realized I wasn't shot. But then he kind of went around the whole van and he broke out all the windows in our personal car. It was our little, you know, little minivan that we had there. And I broke out all the windows all the way around the van. And people started reaching in, grabbing it, and the mob went wild. Chris and the kids were, were whisked off by some friends who also thought I'd been shot. And they couldn't even see me anymore because there were like 100 people packing in around our van. I was scared to death. Um, obviously, my family was scared. And then uh, a friend of mine who had been driving the other van came and rescued me. Uh, ironically, this Palestinian friend of mine, his name is Jihad. So Jihad came in and he grabbed, he opened the door, he pushed up. He was a really big guy. Uh, he used to be a professional wrestler, a, a Palestinian professional wrestler named Jihad. I, I don't think you'd want to mess with him. And you wouldn't want to. He came in and he grabbed me. And I, I'm, I'm serious. He actually threw me into the driver's, uh, the passenger seat. He grabbed me like that. Imagine reaching into a car door and throwing somebody across to that seat. But he did. The next thing, and I'm not very small. I don't know if you noticed that or not. But, um, and he threw me across, and he jumped in, and he goes, we have to get out of here. And he backed up. Uh, I mean, I think he probably ran over a few people on the way back. I don't know. He just put it in reverse and went, and we screamed out of there. Chris and our three kids were up back up at the street with a bunch of friends huddled, huddled around them. Everybody was crying. My kids are shaking, actually, because they think their dad's been killed. And then here comes Jihad with me in the passenger seat with the van windows broken out, screaming back up backwards up to the top of this hill. He yells at Chris and the kids, get in, get in. 
he grabs me, he jumps out, he grabs me, he kind of pulled me back over into my seat, and we drove off. And it had just started to rain. So they'd also broken the front, the, the windscreen, the front went the windshield of our van. All the windows are broken out. Most of the food's still in the van. Chris and the kids are crying. They still think I've been shot. And then I'm, in fact, Chris kept saying, let me drive, let me drive. You can't drive. And I said, I'm, I'm not shot. She says, yes, you are. I said, no, I, I'm really not. She said, you just don't know. You've been shot. And I, you know, sometimes you kind of see that, like adrenaline kicks in and you, somebody gets shot on the TV or whatever, and they're fine for a little bit. But I'm like, no, I don't think, there's no blood anywhere. I don't feel any pain. I think I'm fine. And then the kids are crying, and we're driving away. And Anna, our oldest, who's now 24, who, by the way, in two weeks is moving back to Beirut, to start a film school for Syrian refugees. Anna, our 14-year-old girl at the time, said, Daddy, I don't want to go back there anymore. And I said, I don't want to either. <laughs> and we drove away very slowly and very quietly as it rained inside the car. And that's in that story. It d didn't turn out well. And there's no redeeming part to that story. It, it wasn't like, and then the next day, an angel showed up and they all got saved. No. <laughs> I mean... Nothing exciting happened. It was just a bad, that's a bad story. And by the way, we have lots of stories like that. There are lots of stories in our life that are not good stories. They're in our life personally. So it's fun to write about the cool stuff. It's fun to talk about. It's fun to talk with each other about the cool it's, 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 It feels good to encourage each other in our faith, doesn't it? About, and, t and tell good stories. And it does. And that is appropriate. That is a good thing to do. But Jesus is also in the bad stuff. He is there. And the hard times and the failures, when you fall down, when you think, the worst is when you think God told you to do something, when you think God told you to do something and it doesn't work out well. Like, we thought God told us to go minister to those people on the beach. I think he did. And it turned out horribly. So what is the point then? So what is the point? So I told you really cool stories and I told you some bad stories. Here, here's my thought. Jesus says over and over and over again, one little phrase. It's actually just two words. He says the most consistent thing Jesus calls his disciples, his followers to do, and it's why we're called followers of Jesus, because he said over and over, follow me. Jesus, he doesn't just invite you into a cool adventure so you can write a book called Adventures in Saying Yes and that you can give talks to people. He doesn't call you so that you can have success all your life. He doesn't call you to change the world. There's actually no language like that. He does call you to make disciples, but he doesn't call you to change the world. He calls you to follow him. And, and I've found my life in my life that there's a direct correlation. The closer I am to Jesus, the more cool stuff happens. But sometimes not. Sometimes I'm feeling very close to Jesus. I mean, we, we knew God spoke to us to go to Iraq right on the heels of the American troops in 2003. We actually followed in an, a bunch, like two miles long of tanks, U.S. tanks and troops when we went into Iraq in 2003. We followed them. And we knew God actually spoke to us very clearly. And on the way back out is when we got run off the road, literally run off the road, taken by a, a group of Iraqi gang members, thugs, and taken off into the desert and completely robbed. And one of the times when the gun was put to my head and the guy, the gun was right there to my head and he said, are you afraid? Have you ever heard that in those moments of intense fear, God places a bubble of protection, like protective peace around you? It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I was terrified. He said, are you afraid? And to Bakaf, he said in Arabic, I said, Nam, yes, I'm afraid. But God had told me to go there. I think we have to get our theology right of what it means to follow Jesus. Sometimes you might be used profoundly. Sometimes a big, exciting thing will happen, something amazing, an, an Acts 2 kind of an experience, where we prayed, we prayed saying this morning uh, that the Holy Spirit would come into this place. Have you ever thought about what would happen if God actually came into this place? Like God, God. You know what would happen? You'd all die. So you're not really asking for God to actually show up. You're asking for like just a little tiny bit of him to show up. 
Because even when a little bit of God's presence shows up, like it did this morning, you can you feel something, don't you? I mean, if you're alive, you should feel something. That's beautiful. That's the presence of God. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't always work out well. Paul says this. Paul says in Philippians 3, he, he kind of gives his CV. He gives his resume, <clears throat> you know, how good he is. Basically, he does what I did at, did at the first. Actually, that's where I got this idea. When I woke up this morning, Philippians 3 was in my brain. And uh, Paul kind of gave a resume of how he's so cool. He's the right kind of a Pharisee. He's the right kind of a Jew. He's born into the right tribe. He studied under the right, uh, the right teachers in regards to all things legal, all things of the law, which is what they had then. He was perfect. He actually said that. In regards to the law, I'm faultless. He was a perfect Jewish Pharisee. But then he just realized he was only missing one thing. What was the one thing Paul and the Pharisees at that time were missing? Start with the J. Jesus. They were just missing Jesus. They had all the other stuff. And I think that's so easy for us to do today. It's so easy for us to get on fire, to get excited, to want to change ourselves and our friends and our spouses and change the world. And we actually just miss Jesus. It's not about whether we know famous people or not. It has nothing to do with that. And if you do, good for you. If you don't, if you're a regular person, which I think all of us are regular people, and you do a regular thing and you have a regular job, if you follow Jesus into that thing and that regular job, you will live an adventure because you're with him. And Jesus is adventurous. Jesus asks us to follow him. I want to pray for you this morning, just something very, uh, very personal, kind of something personal to me in, in this. It was interesting, in writing this book about fear, I had in the last two years, it's taken me two years to write this stupid thing. I mean, this wonderful book. Uh, <clears throat> I had more fears, I had more fears pop up in my life than I've ever experienced before. Uh, fear of failure, fear of you know, then once you start to know some famous people, then you know other people. You know, you never get there. If you're trying to climb the ladder, you realize the higher up the ladder you climb, that there's always like a hundred more ladders, not just rungs, but a hundred more ladders above that. There's no such thing as climbing a ladder, especially not in the kingdom of God. There's no such thing. If you want to have more influence, if you want to be a better leader, there's no such thing as going from here to here, this position, you know, raising your position. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. <clears throat> but I had all the fears, like when my book comes out, will anybody care? Will anybody read it? Uh, I was very personal in this book. It's, I mean, I tell some of the most embarrassing stories in the world. I tell all of our biggest failures. My wife uh, wrote part of the book. Our three kids each wrote uh, one story in the book. And to see the whole dynamic of the family, kind of, they're, they're nervous that, <clears throat> am I done? <laughs> uh, they're, they're, okay, let's cut them off. <clears throat> they're nervous. They're nervous that people will read their story and, and not like it. I mean, it brings up all the insecurities you have. I, I thought this morning, I was sitting back there in the back trying to pray, and I was praying for this morning, but then I was also thinking, yeah, gosh, I hope this turns out well. I don't really, I mean, this isn't much of a, this isn't like a proper talk. I just want to share some thoughts with you guys. I've never done this before. I've never talked about these things ever before with anybody. And so I was feeling insecure as I walked up. I felt insecure. I'm standing there, I'm being prayed for. My feeling is not one of power and faith. It was one of insecurity. Like, why am I here? I mean, why am I the one standing up talking to you? I would have been happy to listen to the worship team the whole rest of the morning. That would have made me happy. That would have been good to do. Fear is very real. Failure is very real. If you want to know if you'll fail in life, let me just answer that for you. Yes, you will fail. You will try to do something very, very hard. You'll put all your effort into it, and it won't work. And then you have to know what you're left with. Will you be afraid Will there be fears? I've had two kids that graduated from college. They realize it's hard to get a job. They're freaked out by getting jobs. Is it going to be hard to get a job? It probably will be. Will you get a lot of rejections? You will. Will that make you, will that make you feel bad about yourself? Even though they say, I'm not rejecting you personally, I just don't need that. Yes, you'll, you will feel rejected. You will feel bad. And what are you left with? You want to be left with Jesus. If you're not left with Jesus, you're left with nothing. Let's pray. So, Father, we pray that, uh, that your son, 
would be the one that we are clinging to, the one that we are left with. Because when we're left with Jesus, we're actually not left with, I mean, just anything or anyone. We're, we're left with the king, with the creator of the universe. I mean, to be just left with Jesus is an oxymoron. That's crazy to even say it that way. We can't just be with Jesus. We are, wow, we're, we're with Jesus. Our Savior, our friend, our Lord, our Master, our King, the one that we follow, the one that we're close with, the one that loves us so much it's unbelievable, we're left with you. And so I pray this morning that for the ones that are uh, thinking they're changing the world, I think that's great that they have that in, in their hearts, and their minds. Help them just to focus in on what's most important, to follow you, Jesus. For the ones here this morning that are a bit apathetic, they just kind of sit around with their hands in their pockets and don't really care what's going on around them. They're just kind of apathetic people. Actually, in a sense, that's okay as well for right now. But I pray that those also would be emboldened and impassioned not to change the world, but to follow you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are and what you do and how you love us and how you treat us and how you call us into your adventure, not ours, but yours. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.